in your house. It's a piece of, it's a solid slug of metal, uh, a grade one mortise lock, it has to be, have at least a three quarter inch dead latch. And you notice that little piece on top, well, when those things close into the door pocket, uh, there's a, you know, a, a strike that they latch against. That little thing closes, and the good ones, you can't shim that. Um, that locks it completely. So if you were to put a carpet knife or something in, if there was a gap, you didn't have an anti-shim plate or whatever, uh, it wouldn't really be able to, to do much. Uh, the other kind, um, it's pretty common too, has actually like uh, anywhere from like two to five uh, individual dead latches that close in opposition to each other, so you can't shim it from either direction, and it's just as strong as a deadbolt. It has, little, has at least as much mass of material just over a, a different configuration. And these are built this way so that when you hit the, the solenoid, you know, they, these things either fail safe or fail secure, so either applying power to it opens it or releasing power to it opens it. In the case of fire exits, it's more common to be fail safe. <coughs> uh, these guys are basically going to become retractable. Either the act of turning the, the, the doorknob or the handle retracts those, or in a lot of cases, just the act of opening the door collapses those little uh, dead latches. They capsize into the door pocket and you can open the door. And they're made to latch on their own when it closes with very, very little friction. Uh, one of the key features also, the one on the right, the uh, one and one eighth um, commercial cylinder, uh, any kind of lock, if you have a choice, uh, you'll have a lot of high security lock choices for the key bypass if you, if you choose something that has that little threaded cylinder. There's also another one called SFIC, small format uh, interchangeable core, I think, small form factor. Uh, those are great too. When you get to the you know, typical like cylinder, key and knob, residential locks, those are hard to electrify and you typically don't have a lot of good choices for security locks and they're expensive. Uh, so the magnetic lock, uh, how many of you guys interact with one of these on a daily basis, right? These are like love and hate. Uh, locksmiths like installing them because they're, you can put one on darn near anything. You can put it on a drug cabinet in a hospital or you can put it on uh, you know, the front door to a lobby with glass doors that you can't drill holes or obviously or anything in. Uh, they have some serious downsides though. Um, now let me explain how these work. This, this metal part on top, that's you know, maybe about an inch thick and it's a big epoxy potted device filled with very fine magnet wire. It's a big electromagnet. And uh, the part on the bottom, that's screwed to the door, that's called the armature. So when you close the door and apply power, uh, that thing clamps down on it provided there's a good fit up. And anywhere from 600 pounds to uh, 1,200 pound models are available. They have 150 pound models for like little cabinets and things. Uh, they even have maybe 2,000 pound models. They're very strong if they're installed properly. Uh, they also are inherently fail safe. So if you cut power to it, it will open, which is a good thing. There's really no mechanical part to jam up because the door got messed up in an earthquake or whatever. It's just going to work. So those are used a lot for life safety things, even though they may not be as secure. Um, couple problems with them, they require very precise alignment. If there's so much as two sheets of paper gap between them or like some clear tape, you can body check it and the door will just open with maybe 50 pounds or 20 pounds of force and not 2,000 or whatever it's rated to. And they do, the, the doors, you know, wear and sag and things, they have to be adjusted from time to time. So uh, the other problem, unlike a, let's say a mortise lock where there is a separate keyhole that can bypass it and a separate doorknob that you can turn to mechanically open it regardless of what the electronics say. Uh, these don't have that. You have to install a button, a request to exit sensor to interrupt power to it, sometimes both. You know, uh, maybe a motion detector, request to exit, and uh, you know, some kind of button you push. Uh, so token readers. So we have a few different examples. These are from my collection. Um, they typically have things like pin pads, uh, RFID readers on board. This one in the middle is kind of cool. This is a Hearst scramble pad. Uh, that's just a pin reader, uh, but every time you hit start to put in a pin, it actually scrambles up the location of the numbers, and it has this interesting little uh, thing with a bunch of sheets of plastic laid on edge that make it difficult to shoulder surf. You have to be looking at it straight on. One of the things, uh, talking to people who you know admin these systems and so forth, they mentioned that people seem to be less likely to give up the, the entry code to the pizza guy when one, it has a procedure you have to explain, and two, they look at that like, hmm, maybe they're trying to tell me that I shouldn't give that to anyone. So uh, what these 
also have in common, some systems do have Ethernet directly going out with you know, some kind of secure-ish protocol. Uh, but majority of these, though, are using either Wigan, which is a two-wire serial interface that sends everything in the clear, or RS-45, which is a long-range serial port. We use a lot of industrial applications to put up 32 devices on there, but it's just it's the big brother to RS-232 serial cables. Uh, or they use some other type of proprietary protocol, like Hirsch has a proprietary protocol and a big angry message put in the back saying it's a crime to reverse engineer this product. Kind of funny. Uh, a lot of other companies feel that way, probably, but they don't. They, one of their security features is that our protocol is unpublished and only works with our stuff, so we can sell more of it. But in theory, that makes it more secure. That's, uh, I don't know, that's a little challenging. Because of that, almost all of these guys are. Uh, going to be in their lowest security mode whenever they have to interact with another vendor's gear. So if you buy all gear from the same ecosystem, from the same vendor, they do have, in fact, an encrypted protocol, maybe even a public key exchange or a three-way handshake, so you can't plug in a rogue reader device, perhaps. But the second it has to interact with that fire alarm or that you know, other building control system that's been there for five years, it's almost always going to one of these clear text, less fun modes, or it's going through a gateway that talks encrypted AES and you know on one side and dumb wagon signals on the other side. So definitely vulnerable to interception at those points. Uh, some of the sensors we have out there, uh, everyone has probably seen the PIR, the motion detector, right? Uh, they come in a couple different flavors. Uh, the good ones, like the one on the right, have both a sensor that detects, it's basically uh, body heat, you know, that's how they work. They have two sensors. Uh, a little Fresnel lens slices it up into zones, and when pretty much one of them uh, goes hotter than the other zone, and they're sliced into lots of little pie slices, and they're scanned at something like a kilohertz, you'd have to move incredibly slowly to not trip it just by motion. You'd have to not be hot, basically. Uh, but they will go off. They also will go off occasionally for things like uh, you know this one wall getting extra warm because the uh, the heating systems behind it, or the sun shines through the curtains right onto it, and you know quickly when it passes a tree. There's lots of reasons they can false. Uh, microwave sensors can false for different reasons, like someone standing right outside your window, knocking on the door, can set it off even though it's only supposed to protect your space. Uh, these dual sensor actually kind of have the best of both worlds. They won't go off unless the microwave and the uh, the infrared go off, and they reduce your false alarm by quite a bit. Uh, acoustic sensors. The one on the right is a really old school ultrasonic motion detector. Those really aren't used much because they anymore. Uh, they false alarm a lot and they have a limited range. They're basically a distance finder. So they're doing what they call volumetric detection. Is there something here closer than there was before? Um, acoustic glass break sensors, these are used quite a bit. They literally have a microphone and a little microcontroller or DSP chip that uh, and some filtering circuits that listen for the sound of broken glass. So when glass breaks, they will uh, basically process the signal and they'll send out uh, an alarm. They'll close a little relay. And those can actually even protect an area of several windows or a whole room uh, if they're installed properly. And these all have directions you know, for what they will and won't detect and you know, whether you need two of them or how you should wire them up. Uh, but those are actually kind of a cool sensor. Uh, when I mentioned alarm wiring, uh, going through alarm systems and so forth, one of the things I discovered is that almost all of the you know, commercial sites are probably not going to use wireless sensors. Uh, they don't want to have to send someone around to change batteries and the things get knocked off the wall and, and whatever, and uh, false, stuff like that. So they typically use what they call uh, three or four state alarm supervision. And they basically have uh, a couple of relays and they there are a couple of uh, resistors, and they form a normally closed loop. So <clears throat> what happens when your switch is closed on those sensors? Uh, current will flow through one resistor, through that sensor, and then back to ground or back to, to your 5-volt, typically like a I know, 3 to 12-volt loop is common. All of these sensors have a dry contact, so you can put whatever voltage you want through it. Uh, but basically, they're able to detect a couple different things. If that switch opens on that sensor, like someone opens the door or sets off the motion detector, uh, that will change the current path, so it'll now have to go through two resistors, and it can tell that. If someone were to short out the wires, the resistance would decrease, uh, depending on where they shorted it out. Uh, and if someone were to cut the wires, 
uh, it would go open circuit, all of those, depending on how they occur, can be detected as unique states as a, a tamper, a cut, a fault, or an alarm, or an everything is A-OK -okay state. Uh, so that's why I, uh, one of the challenges of designing one of these things, you want something that has some analog inputs and can differentiate these if you can, makes it more secure. So talking about that threat model, you know, now that we've, you know, we know what kind of the pieces are, you know, what are some of the advantages? So it's easy to revoke keys. We can do things that are more difficult with mechanical locks, like we can allow flexibility in our security policy. We can say, hey, I don't trust this person, or they don't have a need to have 24 access to everything in here, but uh, I would like them to have business hours access, or I'd like to restrict it to you know, a certain time, a certain zone. I only want someone who has a meeting at this public meeting room you know, once a month to just have it open and close for them once a month and not you know, two in the morning on Sunday. Uh, and I can do things like give my uh, different access policies to my public areas. Maybe I can give my visitors the ability to come in and out of the outer perimeter into the lobby and the, the break room, but maybe not my R&D area. Uh, it will encourage people perhaps to follow a better security policy. But <clears throat> doors can be always locked if it takes half a second to open them, you know, and, and the badge is already around their neck, it's not as big a deal. Uh, we can alarm on things like human failures, uh, door props, uh, tailgating. There actually are sensors that are fairly easy to deploy that can detect how many people walk through a door, what direction they went through, the better ones. Uh, they basically use IR beams and they you just have a pulse counter that counts how many pulses came in and how, to the first one and how many pulses made to the second one. Interesting stuff. Uh, of course, we can audit things, right? We can see the log if something you know, goes missing or you know, someone had an, an issue after the fact or an employee was terminated or whatever it is. Um, we can also integrate with those other systems. So some of the disadvantages, uh, we can definitely clone the tokens. Almost anything electronic can be reverse engineered and copied, right? You can do that with a mechanical key too. <coughs> One problem is that some of these can be done at a distance, which is a little different security model than we're used to. Uh, these all require electricity. Uh, someone can deliberately interrupt or manipulate power. Um, I had a customer, it's a construction company, and somebody uh, sabotaged their generator so it wouldn't start, and then they cut a four kilovolt feed line using insulated tools, because probably they made one of their electrical contractors mad. You know, it happens, and it was on payday. So, you know, you've got people who get an hour of overtime for every hour of their check's late. Well, you do the math, right? So power is definitely something that you have to consider. Almost all of these should have some kind of UPS. And power can, or systems can fail maybe in unpredictable ways. Uh, mechanical stuff, it's pretty obvious it can either fail open or you know, fail jammed up and you have to call a locksmith. You know, will these do something weird if you know they end up in a state where there's not enough power to reliably keep the microcontroller booted, or you know the lock draws too much power because you undersize the power supply and it reboots the thing? Those are all possibilities that need to be tested for. Uh, brute force attacks, right? You know, has everyone uh, heard of uh, like what a set of tryout keys is? Those used to be car dealers had them, a key to like every possible Chevrolet. Well. Nobody's probably going to do that in front of, you know, even on a modest lock, you know, there's thousands of combinations. But if you can have a device, you can double-sided sticky tape to the reader that'll do that over the weekend while you're not there, you might consider doing that. You don't even have to be there. And of course, the, the network, uh, the servers, the wiring, all of those things really need to be, you know, behind the fence, basically in the secure or more controlled area and preferably not running around outside and not in conduit with, you know, if possible, the boxes should have tamper switches, things like that. Uh, so some of the access tokens we have, uh, we have contact technologies. Those would be mag magstripe cards. Everyone has a bank card in your wallet, right? Just like that. There's a format called ABA. There are a bunch of proprietary one weird ones used in hotels that are harder to read. I can show you the gear that does both those. Uh, Wigan cards, those are interesting. Those are a little card that has pieces of magnetized wire oriented north-south and uh, swiping it across a, a reader has little basically tape heads that read that. Those are fairly hard to, to clone. I mean, they, they don't contain very much data and they're pretty old technology, uh, but they're interesting because they're, they don't have some of the vulnerabilities that like modern, usually contactless RFID systems have. Um, there are also some neat things. Uh, they're smart, you know, 
uh, smart cards like the Kinko's card. Uh, Strom Carlson did a talk about that. Uh, those may or may not be, those can be very secure and they can also be pretty poor. Uh, the lowest level implementation just reads, asks the card what it thinks its serial number is, or even worse, it just looks at a value that says is authorized or not, that kind of thing. Better, app, better systems, they can have kilobytes to megabytes of data storage, and they can do things like run an application that does a, a three-phase challenge response system. Hey, are you one of my cards? Well, I don't know. Are you one of the readers I'm supposed to talk to? And they negotiate a, a, a type of handshake where they do some challenge response and never actually trade anything secret to determine if they're supposed to get in. Those are better systems. Uh, the, it used to be the Dallas, now it's uh, Maxim iButton. That's a little uh, sealed metal can. It's used for environmental sensors. A lot of security guard systems use them. They have to clock in at buttons that are epoxy to the wall. But they have keychains and stuff. Those were kind of neat because they're very easy to hook up to an Arduino or some kind of, of uh, electronic device. They have a simple protocol. Uh, and then the contactless, which is probably 90% of the market. Uh, people who run buildings like these because there's nothing to get dirty. You can put the reader behind the glass even so every bit of wiring is protected, which is good. Um, they can be passive RFID, which is your typical thing you probably have in your wallet or your keychain. They can be active, like the mobile speed pass, uh, asset tagging tags you put on pallets. Uh, anyone ever uh, use the toll road and seen that transponder you put on your on your dashboard? Well, that's an active RFID tag. Uh, those have a long range. Long range often is not what you want. You know, you maybe want to not have this work until you are just about touching it. But on the other hand, if you're a warehouse, maybe you want your trucks to have the gate opened as they drive in, you know, and they're eight feet off the ground and 10 feet from the gate. That's reasonable. Uh, and then they have things like car alarm remotes. They, they like putting these things in like residential home, you know, alarm systems and stuff. Uh, I'm not crazy about that. Uh, you're going to be building some of those for your badge, I guess. So, uh, so the low frequency tags, uh, these have a pretty short range uh, on the order of like zero to five centimeters. Uh, the power for it is actually being magnetically coupled. So they have to ha be pretty close to get that. I think it's the B field that does that. Uh, they're primarily read only, uh, like the HID 125 kilohertz tag everyone has on their wallet. Um, there's an EM4100, which is kind of like a, an ANSI or a, an ISO standard that's similar to it, but open. Uh, there are read-write versions of that, like the Q2. I have some that work with this cloner that you can read a tag and then write, write a writable version of it. Uh, they typically have slow data transfer, and you're only you know, pulling maybe between 32 and 128 bits of data off of them, and it's typically just like a fixed serial number. Uh, and some have security features like the high tag. Uh, those are used a lot in automotive applications. Uh, so here's some tokens. I have a bunch up on the table for you to check out as well. They can be everything from an implantable glass capsule to the your typical HID corp uh, key fob, your uh, what's called a clamshell uh, card that's has a, a coil of wire in it, and they're usually thick. You can tell they're the low frequency tags. They're never paper thin. Uh, the high frequency tags, uh, typically the 13.5 megahertz band, that's the most common one. A little longer read range, 10 to 20 centimeters. Uh, more advanced features possible. Some of them have little microprocessors embedded on them and they can do uh, simple encryption, different types of handshakes, stuff like that. Uh, they can, you know, th in theory, mutually authenticate uh, like we try and do with SSL poorly. Uh, most of them do not support something like a full version of SSL or TLS. There's some kind of lightweight proprietary protocol and often a proprietary tag format and encryption that was made up by the vendor. Uh, the, the ISO uh, 14443A uh, is one of the most common formats, and that defines the low-level standards of that. Uh, the most common version of that is the MyFair card. Uh, that's a Philips semiconductor uh, design, I believe. Uh, they're available in all kinds of different formats. Uh, these are used, uh, the one on the lower left is an LA Transit System card. Turns out that is a MyFair card. The one on the lower right, uh, that's the hotel key from last year. Guess what? Marriott uses a 1K uh, MyFair Classic, I think it is. So not the most secure in the world. Uh, the encrypt it does have onboard encryption. You have uh, basically small data blocks that you require, I think it's a 48-bit key, to uh, read and write them. Well, it turns out through talking to them and sending some malformed you know, challenges and things, in about 15 minutes you can break all the, the cell security and you can read and write the code. So not terribly secure, but you have to understand these 
weren't necessarily designed for high security. They were designed for low cost, you know, things like you know, transit and bus systems and stuff like that. And they're being used more and more for higher value stuff that maybe they weren't engineered for. Uh, so some of the things you can use for auditing, uh, this is a pretty cool device on the left. Uh, it's a card classifier from a company called RF Ideas. And they have two models, uh, the high frequency and the low frequency. And you can plug that into your laptop and it shows up as a keyboard wedge. Uh, basically shows up as another input device. You leave a card on it for about 10 seconds and it will tell you what kind of card it is and depending, it will try to read at least a serial number or whatever data it supports reading from it. If it's a more sophisticated you know, protocol that has to have a conversation with the card, it doesn't have support for that. Uh, but they do have models that you can hook up to a PC and configure to, to have those, those interactions. Uh, but this is kind of neat because you can take any random uh, RFID tag and know pretty quickly what it is and get the serial number and a few things. Uh, this company sells some really awesome universal readers. They can basically uh, be programmed to have, you know, up to like, you know, one of like, I think two, sim one or two simultaneous personalities out of a choice of like 70 different vendors' readers. So they can just emulate in software. Uh, and this device on the right I have over here, this is uh, an EM card cloner. You can get one of these on eBay pretty cheap. This is like, I think, 50 bucks. Uh, these are sold a lot because uh, many of these tags are used in automotive applications. So there's a strong market for aftermarket uh, electronic key tag cloners for cars. No one wants to pay $500 at their Mercedes dealer if they can buy the, they can go to some shop that will make them a working key for 50 bucks. So these are all over the place. Uh, bottom line, right? Uh, most of the security features in these cards are closed source, not well documented. You typically have to sign an NDA and you know, be in their their program to, to get any kind of detailed information, APIs. It really doesn't give you the warm fuzzies in terms of security. Uh, a lot of these have an active cloning community, mostly because of automotive users. And it was developed for you know, low cost. Almost all the, the widely uh, deployed systems like the MyFair uh, that have been out in the wild long enough and subject to some rigorous evaluation have been found to be really lacking technically. So if it can be read, you should, if it can be read, you should just assume it can be cloned. And you should implement your software on the back end with your software, your security policy, uh, rather than the card. You know, if you want to do something like uh, increment a counter on the card, or just something basic like you swipe the card, it reads it, it rewrites it with a new key before it uh, releases the door, you can basically not have to rely on a lot of that security if you want a better environment. Uh, what we also found out, though, is that most people don't care about that. Really, we're working about we're working on the Derek and Charlie level most of the time. Darn near anything we can do is probably better than the the five pinch leg lock we had on that door before. And our vulnerability is probably going to come from people misplacing their keys and propping the door open, or someone smashing the window, and not from someone breaking the theoretical encryption strength uh, of our wiring. Right. So we came up with some design criteria. We basically wanted this to be affordable. Uh, typical commercial systems are in the order of like two to three thousand dollars per door installed and you know, we didn't have that kind of money. Uh, so we want something that would use commodity stuff which meant the, the wagon interface. Those are the most uh, common readers. You can buy new open start ones. You can buy used building takeout uh, hid and other readers on eBay. Uh, you can buy new ones for a couple hundred bucks. They aren't horribly expensive. We want to have a two door com uh, capability and we want to be uh, able to run independent of a PC, at least you know, it could work in conjunction, but it, it should work if our server's down. And we want to have logging, auditing, and uh, supervised alarm zones. And the other thing, everybody seemed to have a different idea of what they want their workflow to be. So other hackerspaces who've deployed these, uh, they'll do all kinds of different things like uh, you know, time-based, uh, have, you know, stuff open and close in response to when someone comes in the door. Maybe they want a, a door chime mode. Some of the stuff was available, commercial systems, some wasn't. And, you know, we basically want to, a board that could be, at least the bill of materials was under $100 if possible. And you want to use something people can maintain, like Arduino or some other open source micro. So, now uh, we've had these out. Uh, we've been selling them to other hacker spaces as well. and. Uh, there's about 15 active sites, probably three or 400 users enrolled in it. And we have, uh, I guess, about four code contributors. We've got a uh, database app uh, someone's developing. Uh, someone's already done a simple web-based front end for it. Has a serial console now. Linux scripting. 
Start off our 1.0 ugly version, went to the version 2, which is deployed at most of the sites, and now we have a version 3, which has a bunch of fancy stuff like support for an LCD, the Arduino is built in, or you can use your other, you know, whatever favorite Atmel programming environment you want. Uh, it has four alarm zones, it has input protection. Really, these devices are mostly about protecting the inputs and outputs from voltage spikes, and you know, you're turning big heavy magnetic things on and off, and you need to suppress all of those transients and all that stuff. So the electronic design part isn't super complex, but it's got to be made at least as robust as stuff that goes in like a car. It's a bad environment. And uh, some of the features we have now, uh, RS-45 port, two reader support. We have a built-in app mega and a, three and a, a USB chip. Uh, we, have, we found a nice little 128 kilobyte uh, user interface, so we actually store all the tags on board uh, the old one we could put, I believe, is 200 users on. This one, in theory, it could be expanded to 10,000 plus. Uh, people have also been wanting to use these and have been deploying these for locking out like their equipment. Maybe they have a laser cutter or a CNC machine. Well, you can wire one of these relays into the emergency stop button and make people badge in and you know before they're able to, to activate the thing after they set their program up or whatever. And we put a, a real-time clock on board and a bunch of auxiliary I.O. so people can, can use them. And we uh, also came up with a mega version, which we're going to be selling pretty soon. And uh, that has eight relays and uh, 15 alarm zones, and also a voltage monitoring thing. So it, if you have a UPS or some other system hooked up to it, it can tell if it's on battery and how healthy it is. And we kind of came up with an overall architecture where you know, we're distributing these small modules, and they can be linked up with RS-45, and then go into you know, a master Ethernet system. Uh, we're looking at also, we've been using a little uh, called plug PCs. It's a small Linux computer. And uh, we're looking at the, the Raspberry Pi. Uh, a couple of our users just got them and they're working on integrating them. So it costs you know, 30 to 50 bucks to add Ethernet to any of the Arduino and you know, small microcontroller devices if you're not doing it in quantity. Well, now there are basically full-blown servers available in the $30 price range. We're thinking of maybe just skipping that and going straight to you know, a little server device on board. So this is your typical install. A lot of people have been putting these in just like old alarm system panels that came with their buildings, things like that. And you've got a power supply, a battery backup, and then you just move your wiring in there. Um, so really quickly, uh, the wiring, you have to protect it. Uh, they're man in the middle attacks. So you can definitely have a replay device that will listen to a valid card read and replay it if you swipe your card that's the rogue one. Uh, Zach did that at... Uh, 2007 layer one, I believe. Uh, the wiring can be shorted out. You can possibly you know, blow some fuses. And if it's a uh, fail open or fail uh, safe door, you may very well open the front door. So subtle things like not wiring the reader to the that's on the outside to the same uh, power supply or fuse as the inside. And you can do things to subvert alarm sensors. And the readers themselves, they have uh, Outside wiring, it can be difficult to protect. You can you know, clone, skim, do all kinds of stuff to them. Uh, you can do denial of service attack. Uh, a lot of these cards have no anti-collision capability. So if you were to just epoxy one of these little RFID beads to them, uh, nobody's valid card would ever be read. So kind of not obvious. Maybe it's the, equi uh, the electronic equivalent of sticking super glue in someone's lock. Uh, and very few of these systems are doing you know, any type of encryption or challenge response. What we have been looking at is doing things like maybe having an interactive conversation with a phone app. Some of the newer uh, Android phones support NFC, near field communication. That's basically it can act like a MyFair card or reader. Kind of cool stuff. Um, all these door hardware devices have vulnerabilities. You can you know, shim uh, a piece of paper or something like that into the door magnets. Uh, some of the strikes, you might be able to put a strong magnet on it. And this is my favorite, uh, double door with a motion detector and a magnet. Uh, all you have to do is wave a sheet of paper in between these and they open. And there's all kinds of variations like putting a balloon underneath and doing things like that. The classic Bosch Rexon.